morning. Please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. We'll be reading verses 22 to 31. These are the living words of Christ. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind, to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. May the Lord bless the reading, the hearing, the believing, the obeying of his word. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your truth written and preserved for us in your word. O Lord, we pray that you would take your word by your spirit, renew our minds, and be magnified. Show us your great glory, and show us who we are in creation and in redemption from the fall. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Every single one of us has become very familiar with the idea of placing people into racial categories. News and social media never stops categorizing people according to different races, in the plural. Racial identity has never been more greatly emphasized. We ourselves may not think twice when we're asked to indicate our race on a job application or college application or survey with the options white, black, Asian, Latino, etc. I'm sure folks have plenty of reasons why they're convinced placing people into racial categories is necessary or helpful. But the fact is, a certain racial label on someone, such as black or white, often attaches a stigma upon that person. And it carries with it tons of stereotypes, assumptions about who that person is or who they should be, other expectations. Plus this racialization of image bearers, labeling them with a race, racialization, has been and continues to be divisive. It divides image bearers. It's often used for power, whether to discriminate against a person or group or to make accusations 
in order to gain benefits from the guilty. This raises the question. By the way, Pastor John's outstanding You Asked For It series is over. And so now this is the You Didn't Ask For It, But I'm Going to Give It To You Anyway (laughs) series. It raises multiple questions. Are these modern racial categories biblical? Does the Bible have racial distinctions? Are there really multiple races? Does the living God categorize his creatures according to racial categories? Well, we'll see in the next few weeks, the Bible certainly teaches there are different people groups. Does the Lord really categorize people groups based on the amounts of melanin in their skin? Why this sermon series called Thinking Biblically About Race? Because the Lord cares greatly about his people thinking rightly. He commands us to be renewed in our minds, to be transformed by his word and no longer conformed to the standards of the world. God made us to act and behave based on our thinking, based on thinking rightly. And so our perception and understanding of things will always influence our actions. So when it comes to the concept of race, we must think biblically. When it comes to the notion of race, let's ask the Lord to help us to take every thought captive to the knowledge of Christ, to obey him, to submit our thoughts to his word. Which, by the way, we can only sufficiently understand race with the Bible. In fact, the Bible is necessary to understand race on God's terms. And so that brings us to our main point this morning. There is only one created human race. And we'll unpack these points the next three weeks. One created human race. One fallen human race. One redeemed human race. We'll briefly touch on points two and three this morning with our main focus being the first. There is one created human race. In Acts 17, Luke, the inspired human writer, records for us Paul's defense of the gospel to non-Christians. We can notice that Paul doesn't seek to prove the existence of God He assumes the existence of God based on God's revelation. He presents, this is the God who has revealed himself. I proclaim to you what you think is unknown, what God has made known. Paul has several things to say about who the living God is. In contrast to false gods and idols that the men of Athens worships, the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is self-sufficient. He needs nothing. He's sovereign over all of history. He's kind to non-Christians, giving life and breath and sustenance to all humans. The living God is righteous. He will call every human to account on the day of judgment. But he's also gracious. Through Paul, he's offering repentance and salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. But our focus for this morning is another emphasis of Paul, and it's on human beings. Who and what human beings are. Notice Paul has several things to say about who we are as human beings. In order to know who we are as humans, we must know our origin, our starting point, where we came from. So Paul will seek to make clear our human origin, and then our divine origin. But first, our human origin. There in verse 26, we see that he, God, made from one man every nation of mankind. Paul is speaking to the Greeks. Their nation was known 
Paul came from a different nation. And Paul's point is that from one man, Adam, all nations have come about by the creative work of God. A literal translation of the Greek is God made from one man, from out of one man, every nation. God made every nation of men from out of one, literally. Man being implied. From out of Adam, all nations have come. From out of the one man, every human being who ever existed can find their source. Adam, the first human created by God, had in him all the stuff that you and I have. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Where's Paul getting this from? Well, Paul knows the book of Genesis. And it's interesting that the Hebrew word Adam, Adam's name, man, is sometimes used for the collective human race, mankind as a whole. So the Lord would say in Genesis, Genesis 6, 7, I will blot out Adam, Adam, man, speaking of mankind, whom I have created from the face of the land. And the Lord does this to underscore the fact that there's ultimately one Adamic human race. There is one created Adamic human race. We're all made of the same stuff in terms of our anatomy, our body, our soul. This begs the question, what about the physiological differences that there are amongst humans that we can all notice, such as different skin color, different hair color and hair texture, different eye color and shape? Isn't that proof that there are different races of people? Still very glad you asked. Notice in Acts 17, 26, Paul gives a more specific biblical category, which comes about in Genesis 10 and 11. We'll talk about that more next week. For the different people groups that have come from Adam, every nation of mankind, every ethnos, where we get the word ethnicity. And so Paul is aware of different people groups. And we'll see next week that the nations are made up of tribes and subunits of familial clan groups, usually united together under a human ruler as a kingdom. And at Babel now, speaking different languages, living in different regions. So yes, there are different physical features shared by the various nations and people groups. But guess what? That came from Adam. God made from one man, every nation of mankind. What's my point? The all-wise, all-knowing, all-powerful creator placed into Adam and his wife Eve's DNA every possible physical difference of skin complexion, hair color and texture, eye shape and color, and every other physical trait were bound up in Adam and Eve's wife, in his wife Eve's DNA, when God created them. What is DNA? It stands for do not ask. <laughs> no, seriously. Deoxyribonucleic acid, short for DNA, is the molecule that carries genetic information for the development and functioning of an organism. DNA is the hereditary material in humans. One Bible-believing scientist says DNA is the most complex storage system in the universe. DNA makes up our genes, the various things that determine our own physical features. You might be thinking, Tim, I thought you were going to be preaching from the Bible, and so why are you talking about the study of DNA, that's a different field, the scientific field of genetics, not the Bible. I can't find one verse that literally mentions DNA in Scripture. You might be thinking that. 
Well, we do know from Romans 1, 19 to 20, that God has revealed himself through the things he has created, including through DNA. This is what we call general revelation. And Paul goes on to make clear in that passage, because of sin, we take the truth of general revelation, and what do we do with it? Suppress it. We trade it away, or we distort it. And so, we need special revelation, the Bible, to rightly understand general revelation. What we learn in general revelation, such as in scientific study, will never contradict what God has said in special revelation. The triune God is the creator and designer of genetics, of genes, of DNA. In case I lost the kids here. Kids, the reason why you look the way you do is because of your parents' DNA and their genes. For instance, my mom, her family had very light peach-colored skin that sunburns easily, that gets a bit reddish when you're mad or, or embarrassed. My mom has green eyes, brownish hair in, in, in folks in her family, while my dad has skin that tans a lot easier. And most of the folks in his family have blue eyes and blonde hair. And so what did my three brothers and I have? A mixture of all of the above. While I have more of a skin complexion like my mom and uh, eye color and hair, some of my brothers have more hair and, and skin and eye color similarities to my dad. But what's interesting is some of my brothers have brown eyes. But my parents, neither of them had brown eyes. How did they get brown eyes? Because the genes for brown eyes were still in our parents, in one or the other. And so this gives us a little bit in, of an introduction to another question what about skin color? What about skin color? Every human being has the same basic brown pigment or color called melanin in the skin. Combinations of genes determine how much or how little melanin each person has. Look at our melanin chart there. Here are the various skin tones and shades of melanin that exist in humans. Now, I'm grateful for my kids who understand color very well, in particular with markers and crayons, and they say, Dad, why do people call Mommy black? I don't see black up there. And why do people call you white? It's very interesting. Black and white are not among the melanin shades the various possibilities go from darker brown to middle brown to tan to peach to a lighter peach. And what's interesting is that this melanin is in all of us to various degrees. So this means, ding, we are all people of color. I know that would offend many folks today, but it's facts. And so it's worth mentioning that a father has genes, a mother has genes of various skin tones, and the combo of those genes determines the amount of melanin the child will have. And so we have here, in this chart on the bottom, the various possibilities of the dad going along this way, the various skin tone possibilities of the mom going across that way. And we know that children from the same parents can have different shades of skin complexion because of the gene possibilities within the parents. In just a few generations, different combinations of previously existing genetic information resulted in different skin tones and eye shapes. Modern science recognizes that our differences are superficial, meaning they exist on the surface on the skin level or immediately beneath it. This means if you took a man from China and a man from France and you had an amazing x-ray that saw through their skin, the rest of their physical structure would have very few differences. 
They both have lungs. They both have brains. They both have a heart. And both of them have red blood. What do you know? Answers in Genesis is very helpful on this, particular Ken Ham. Answers in Genesis goes on to say, if Adam and Eve were middle brown shade, their children would have exhibited the whole range of skin tones from light to dark. And now what Ken Ham and other biblical scientists are seeking to do is take the fact that there's these possibilities of melanin up there at the top, and from one man came every nation of mankind. Therefore, those possibilities of melanin must have existed in Adam. And it's very striking that there are certain examples in our day and age that seem to bear witness to this, namely the precious hoarder twins. Look at these precious girls. They have the same mom and dad. And yet, one girl inherited larger amounts of melanin and the other girl inherited smaller amounts of melanin from the same parents. It's striking that one of the girls has precious, rich, brown eyes and the other has blue eyes, although none of her parents immediately have blue eyes. But it's in their genes, in their parents' genes. Ken Ham goes on to say, genetics have proven that the observable differences that exist between human beings are literally no deeper than the skin. And so this brings into view a very important application for us. The Lord is the creator of melanin. He's the master artist who determined the amount of melanin that would be in your skin. And he did not make a mistake. This means that to the living God, all skin complexions, all amounts of melanin in his creatures are fearfully and wonderfully made. They're all beautiful to him. But let us ask, are they beautiful to us? Are they beautiful to you? I have to confess, it's only been in the last couple years that I began to worship the Lord for the skin tone, the amounts of melanin the Lord has given me. And my wife has greatly pointed me to scripture to help me worship the Lord and be grateful for the skin tone that I have. I once despised my skin color, partly because I believe the lie that only tanner or browner skin is beautiful, and partly because I believed the lie. I was guilty by association with other people who are called white or who call themselves white, who I have no relation to except we both come from the one man, Adam, and through the sons of Noah. And yet those people used skin to sin. And therefore, I was guilty by association, so I hate my skin. That's the way that I thought for years. But I needed to have my mind renewed with God's word. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Perhaps you have despised your own skin complexion. But consider that to do it is to despise the living God who created it. Perhaps you or I have sinned by despising people who have different amounts of melanin in their skin or different kinds of hair texture or eye shape. If so, we must repent. And praise God, it's not the unforgivable sin. And we can turn to Christ for forgiveness and transformation. And we must have our minds renewed. And that connects with the word to repent in the Greek is to change your mind. We must reject man-made standards of beauty that says certain hair textures are good hair or that lighter or darker skin is more beautiful. It's very interesting that there has been a redefinition of fair skin. Usually nowadays when someone says they have fair skin, they mean pale skin. But the original meaning of fair means beautiful. We see it in the Trinity hymnal, fairest Lord Jesus, the most beautiful man. But some sinners, out of despising other shades of skin, redefine fair skin to mean light, pale, or white skin, as if that's superior or most beautiful. 
But is that what the scriptures say? Notice in Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 5, the bride of Solomon says, I am very dark and lovely. That word lovely means beautiful. O oh, daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Notice the darkness of her skin complexion is further explained as lovely. And it's unfortunate that some of our older English translations say, I am very dark, but lovely. As if, even though I'm very dark, I'm still beautiful. But that's a bad translation of the Hebrew. And that translation was done through the lenses of sinful interpretation. But notice that the bride of Solomon says that's not the only beautiful complexion. She says to Solomon, son of David, whose name is Beloved, and so there's an allusion to David's name. My beloved is radiant and ruddy, just as David was. Makes sense that Solomon was a bit ruddy, reddish in his skin complexion, distinguished among ten thousands. So whether you're very dark or reddish or peachy, you are beautiful to the Lord. And so we have seen the human origin of the one created race. God himself made from one man every nation. But don't skip over who it is who created every nation from one man. It's the living God, the maker and creator. And so as crucial as it is that we get our one human origin, we need to get our one divine origin. And that's another emphasis of Paul. As the one created human race, We all have one divine origin. Notice Paul picking up in verse 28 of Acts 17. He says, For in him, in the living God, we live and move and have our being. Literally, we exist. As even some of your own poets have said, For we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Paul highlights what even the Greek poets and philosophers noticed. All humans are ultimately God's offspring through creation. Verse 28, being then God's offspring. Verse 29, how did the Greek philosophers know this? Because they're creating the image of God, and God revealed it to them clearly in general revelation. And yet they distorted that general revelation and had multiple gods. Paul called them out on that. But this word for offspring, genos, is not the usual word in the Greek used for offspring. That word sperma is used all throughout the New Testament as the translation of Zerah for seed, offspring. The offspring of Abraham is Christ. And by faith, we are Abraham's offspring. That's not the word Paul uses here. It's very interesting that the NASB translates this word descendant. And that's because genos conveys ancestral stock. It can be translated people or even race. 1 Peter 2.9 You are a chosen genos, a chosen race. What Paul is getting at is that humanity in its very being is a single race. Offspring is in the plural. Nope, it's in the singular. And it's again, genos, descendant, race. Being then God's race. We are derived from God as one created race, his created descendants. We are in our being a race derived from God. And so, newsflash, there is one created human race. And we're getting it from the text. And so an application for us is when we label people with unbiblical categories, such as white or black or any other man-made racial category, it can easily bring with it Painful baggage, stereotypes, false assumptions. Like, since all white people are this way, or all black people are this way, or all Asian people, even though Asian's a huge continent, our Lord was from Asia, and so are people in the Philippines, and so are people from way down here, and they're very different from each other, you must be like this. 
And it often causes us to degrade them from the kind of creature they primarily are. Image of God. And that's the first thing we should think about them. And so notice that God is the one in verse 26 who sovereignly determined and appointed the set time and the set place where all the nations would ever live. The Lord is the one sovereign over the set time in history when you'd be born, and he's sovereign over the place in the world that you'd come from. And so therefore you should praise the Lord for his goodness because he decided the when and the where of your existence and the what, your ethnic heritage. But there's something more important. It's that he created us to worship him. And here's our divine design. The divine design that we have is to worship. Our divine origin means that we've been created by God to worship God, to seek God. We see there in verse 27 that God made from the one man Adam to do the same thing that God created Adam to do, to seek God. Verse 27. And even after the fall, even though now we're all sinners, Paul notices this. We are still very religious. Don't let your co-workers or unbelieving family members try to press you on. I'm not very religious like you. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, I, I see all of your gods, including the God of self, and at times the God of race and ethnicity. But we were created with a divine design to know and love the living God Every human being who has come from Adam has been designed by God for a personal, worshipful, obedient relationship. And because one, there's one created human race, we all have divine dignity. And that's the image of God. Genesis 1 attests to this. Notice that in Genesis 1, verse 11, and in verse 21, can also be seen in verse 24 and 25. Moses, the inspired writer, mentions the different kinds of plants that God created on the third day. The different kinds of sea creatures and birds God created on day five. The different kinds of land animals that God created on day six in verses 24 and 25. And this word for kinds can be translated species is not used for human beings. That's very important. Think about the various amounts of different species of birds in the bird families. There's hawks and eagles who are a threat to our chickens because they like to swoop down, hawks in particular, and, and grab themselves a chicken. A few folks in our congregation can attest to that. But think about the other kinds of birds. There's ostriches which are running birds, like roadrunners. And then there's swimming birds, like penguins. And then there's tiny, cute hummingbirds. Is that how we should think of humans in terms of the different races, different species? Contrary to Charles Darwin, absolutely not. Because though there's different kinds of species of plants and animals, there are not different species of human beings. Well, what kind of creatures are we then? We are God-like, image of God, likeness of God. When it comes to God's creatures, unlike birds and fish and insects, humans, quoting Ken Ham here, are all one kind, one biological race. And so next time you're given a survey or a job application or a college application, and it says, what race are you? Say, image of God. I'm sure you'll get the job then. <laughs> if you're getting hired here at Olive Street Presbyterian Church. But seriously, that is our race, image of God. And there's one of them. Well, then what distinction is there amongst human beings? The only distinction at creation is male and female. So no wonder the serpent would attack image of God regarding race, and often use that as a Trojan horse to get to the fact there's only two genders. 
He hates the living God, and he hates the one human race created in his image. What about Charles Darwin? We have been so influenced by Charles Darwin in our society. Darwin rejected the Bible's account of creation, taught that human beings evolved from apes, and his teaching categorized people based on different species of humans, or favored races as he called them. And since Darwin believed that all humans gradually descended from apes, he took the already existing lie that there are multiple races, and he taught that some of those races have evolved more from ape likeness than others. And this was taught in our public schools in the early 1900s that people from African descent or Native American descent were more ape like and therefore inferior to the higher form of humans, such as us Caucasian, pale skinned men who ran around the woods with paint in our faces, as Nathan alluded to earlier. But how evil has Darwinian evolution, with its belief in multiple races, been? How much has it influenced our world? Notice this quote. Men like Herbert Spencer, Darwin, and Thomas Huxley sought to mythologize the Old Testament, starting, of course, with the creation account of Genesis. It didn't really happen. It's just a myth they said. Unfortunately, tragically, their views inspired men who would come after them and turn the 20th century into the bloodiest in all human history. Stalin, Hitler, and Mao were responsible for the deaths of tens of millions. And it can be shown that they did this because of the influence of Darwinian naturalism, which fanned the flames of ethnic superiority. And I find it so ironic that almost 200 years after Darwinian evolution flooded the earth by storm, the same atheistic worldviews are shared by cultural Marxists who hold to critical race theory. And their starting point is not the one race image of God, not the one created human race that has come from Adam. Their starting point is oppression. Robin DiAngelo says, probably one of the most popular critical race teachers. I don't have to look for racism or oppression. I assume it's already there. It's my starting point. They say it themselves. And so their starting place is putting people in categories of oppressed or oppressor. Do Christians have a different starting place? I rejoice in the five points of Calvinism. But the first point, T, total depravity, which is true, that shouldn't be our starting point when we think about human beings. Our starting point is that we were equally created in the image of God, dignified, given dominion as God's royal creatures, as Adam was created in the image of God, the king to rule as a human king, given dominion over the beasts, especially the serpent, the craftiest of the beasts, commissioned to God, spread God's one kingdom of godliness throughout the world. And so here we are back in Genesis. You thought we were done with Genesis. Adam was created as a worshiper in covenant with God, as a representative of all humanity. We know that if Adam obeyed God in the covenant of works by overcoming the serpent, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he would have eaten from the tree of life which represented the reward, eternal life. Adam, in all humanity, the one created human race, would have passed into an irreversible state of glory in never-ending fellowship with the living God. All of creation would have been heavenized. Humanity would have become the one glorified heavenly race. But that did not happen, did it? Adam... And his wife Eve disobeyed. Instead of blessing, Adam and all humanity received the curse of death, cut off in exile from the living God, condemned as guilty slaves of sin. And so now, there is one fallen human race. Adam's plunge into sin on our behalf brought about a singular fallen human race. Now there is one ruined humanity. 
Recall, Adam's name in Hebrew is either used for him or for the rest of humanity that descended from him. So the Lord saw that the wickedness of Adam, mankind, was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The one Adamic race is ruined. And by natural birth, you're a part of it. And so am I. That means there are other genes passed down from our parents that we didn't talk about. The DNA of sin has been passed down to 10 out of 10 children born in this world. Our sin nature and inclination to hate God and those made in his image. And so now, deeper than our melanin is indwelling sin. Kind of rhymes a little bit. And apart from God's saving intervention, we're all condemned and enslaved in Adam, the old man. What about racial guilt then? What about white guilt? Is that a thing? Biblically speaking, the only racial guilt is Adamic guilt, the imputation of Adam's sin, Romans 5, 12, to all of us. Adam sinned and us being in him sinned. My biggest problem is not white guilt, but Adamic guilt. Yes, we can be guilty of prejudice, racializing others, partiality. We'll talk about that next week. But we're born as God-haters, prone to hate and mistreat and abuse and take advantage of those made in his image. And so the one fallen human race is also the one condemned human race. And that's how Paul concludes his sermon in Acts 17. Notice he says that God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And he's proved this how? By raising that man from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has proven that God will judge sin because he judged it on the cross for his people who repent and believe when he judged it on Christ. And because Jesus himself had no sin of his own, but he died as a sin bearer in the place of his people, God the Father rightly, justly vindicated him, judged him righteous, and raised him from the dead, and has given him authority and power as the resurrected judge of the universe. And so when Jesus returns from heaven, he will line up every human being who ever lived. And he will make a distinction. He will put his creatures into two categories. There are two kinds of people to the Lord Jesus Christ. What does Jesus say in Matthew 25? When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. And he will separate people one from another as black, white, Latino, Asian, or Native American. It's not what it says. He will separate people one from another as people of color or non-people of color. As oppressed or oppressor. No. He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right, the goats on the left, and then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's the distinction our Lord will make at the judgment. Because all humanity was ruined by sin, cursed through their union through the one man, Adam, God became a man to be the new man, the second Adam. 
in order to represent a new humanity of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation who put their faith in him as the new one man who never sinned. His human mother's sinful genes were not passed on to him. He was supernaturally guarded from those as he was conceived in Mary's womb by the Holy Spirit. And so the God-man, the one man who alone deserves blessing from God the Father, instead chose to be cursed for all of his sheep, all of his people, when he died on the cross for our sins, so that we might be blessed forgiven and declared righteous, and through his resurrection from the dead, be set free from enslavement to sin and death and Satan. Jesus Christ, God the Son, died and was raised in order to begin a new humanity, a new race, if you will, so that all united to him by faith might be a part of his one chosen race. And so the Bible again makes a distinction There are two kinds of humans, ultimately. And again, there's different kinds of people, physically, ethnically. Those are God-made differences amongst the one created race. Those do not amount to multiple races. But the main distinction that we find from the beginning is you are either offspring of the serpent, the children of Satan, or offspring of the woman, children of God. Which are you? The Lord has a question for you this morning. And you have to put a check in the box. What is your race? Are you a child of God or a child of Satan? That's the races, the kinds of humans that he thinks of, ultimately. And if you've never repented and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are of your father, the devil. John, taking Jesus' words in John 8 to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil unpacks offspring of the woman and offspring of the serpent in this way. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, not from God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. There are no categories in the living God's mind of black and white, but rather, are you in Adam? Are you in Christ? And so we are either of this world and this perishing fallen world age, enslaved by sin, death, and Satan, or we are of another world, of another age. Notice this distinction. The first man, Adam, was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. As is the man of heaven, so also are the of heaven ones, those of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. And we will be raised up in glorified bodies when he returns. And so in conclusion, in Christ There is one redeemed new human race. Notice Peter speaking to a primarily Gentile church says words that were said to Israel in Exodus 19 and Isaiah 43. And he says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Correction. When you're asked what race are you on the survey, say in Christ or chosen race. Genos eclectos, elected race. But why would Peter take Isaiah 43 20 and apply that to the primarily Gentile church? Because the Lord Jesus Christ, the ultimate Israelite, The blessing of Abraham as promised. All who repent and believe in him are grafted into him to become a part of the one chosen people, the one chosen race. And in this context, 
God's chosen people, his chosen race, are those created and formed. Formed for himself to declare his praise. Created, recreated, reformed to declare his praise. This means that since we've been born again from God and we're being conformed to the image of Christ, we, sh we share the same Holy Spirit DNA as our big brother to worship the triune God and declare his praise. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is your identity. Let's pray. Oh Lord Jesus, we worship you. You created us in your image. You saw we were ruined and you came to make us your own. Thank you for making us a part of this glorious new humanity consisting of people from every tribe and family clan, every nation and kingdom, every language group, every land region. And you've united us to yourself by your blood, by your spirit. Hallelujah. Lord, we pray you would cause us in the midst of being flooded with race talk, to take every thought captive to your word. Lord, help us to think rightly about ourselves, to think rightly about who you are, O oh Lord, as our representative, the new man, and help us to put to death and put away the things that belonged to the old man. For your glory we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and sing our closing hymn, Trinity number 7.